So welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Tregilio. I'm a faculty at the Visual Arts Department and a member of the Cal IT2 Gallery Committee. And as part of our uh, exhibition of Trish Stone Network Error, we invited uh, Cory Doctorow to come speak today. So I'm going to do a short in introduction. Uh, and then Cory will give a talk. And then we'll have an opportunity for a, a brief discussion between the two of us and then a wider discussion with the rest of you uh, in the audience. Um, so, Cory Doctorow is a novelist, essayist, activist, short story writer, blogger, and journalist who contributes to many magazines, websites, and newspapers. He's co-editor of the popular tech website Boing Boing, which is founded boingboing.net, and he works for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit civil liberties group that defends freedom and technology law, policy, standards, and treaties. Among the other hats he wears, Dr. O is a research affiliate at the MIT Media Lab, a visiting professor of computer science at Open University, and a co-founder of the UK Open Rights Group. He co-founded the open source peer-to-peer -peer software company OpenCola and serves on the boards and advisory boards of the Participatory Culture Foundation, the Clarion Foundation, and the Open Technology Fund, and the Metabrains Foundation. He's going to do a short reading for us tonight and also present us a talk on scarcity, abundance, and the finite planet. Dr. O's novels have been translated into dozens of languages. He's won the Locust, Prometheus, Cooper Cylinder, White Pine, and Sunburst Awards. Among his recent books, Dr. O published, Dr. O, Corey, published Walk Away in 2017, my favorite novel of 2017, a novel for adults. And in 2014, he created a young adult graphic novel in real life with Jen Wang, as well as a business book about the creativity on the internet. Information doesn't want to be free. We are very happy to welcome him to Cal IT2 and UCSD tonight. Please give him uh, your welcome as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Michael, for that introduction. Thanks, Trish, for uh, Trisha, for making me part of your exhibition here. So, as you've heard, I'm going to give a, a brief reading uh, from the novel Walk Away, and then I'm going to uh, talk a little about uh, some themes from the novel and my work, uh, Scarcity and Abundance, and then I'm hoping to solicit your questions. I like to do Q&A alternating between people who identify as women or non-binary and people who identify as male or non-binary, and I remind you that a question is, is a single sentence that rises at the end and that while long rambling statements followed by what do you think of that technically qualifies questions they are rarely good ones all right so i'm going to read a little from chapter two which is called you all meet in a tavern sundays at the belt and braces were the busiest and there was always competition for the best jobs the first person through the door hit the lights and checked the infographics these were easy enough to read that e anyone could make sense of them even noobs but Limpopo was no noob. She had more commits into the Belt and Braces firmware than anyone, an order of magnitude lead over the rest. It was technically in poor taste for her to count her commits, let alone keep a tally. In a gift economy, you gave without keeping score because keeping score expected, uh, implied an, expect, an expectation of reward. If you're doing something for a reward, it's an investment, not a gift. In theory, Limpopo agreed. In practice, it was so easy to keep score. The leaderboard was so satisfying that she couldn't help herself. She wasn't proud of this, mostly. But this Sunday, first through the door of the belt and braces, alone in the big common room with, a, with its aligned rows of tables and chairs, all the infographics showing nominal, she felt proud. She patted the wall with a perverse, unacceptable, proprietary air, She'd helped build the belt and braces, scavenging the badlands for the parts its drone outriders had identified for its construction. It was the project she'd found her walk away with, the thing uppermost in her mind when she'd looked around the badlands, put down her pack, emptied her pockets of anything worth stealing, put extra underwear, underwear in her bag, and walked out into the Niagara escarpment, past the invisible line that separated civilization from no man's land, out of the world as it was, and into the world as it could be. The code base had originated with the UN High Commission on Refugees and had been field trialed a lot. You told it the kind of building you wanted, to, you wanted, gave it a scavenging range, and it directed its drones to inventory anything nearby, scanning multiband, doing deep database scrapes against urban planning and building code sources to identify usable blocks for whatever you were making. 
This turned into a scavenger hunt inventory, and the refugees or aid workers, or in shameful incidents, the trafficked juvenile slaves, fanned out to retrieve the pieces the building needed to conjure itself into existence. These flowed onto the job site. The building tracked and configured them, a continuously refactored critical path for its build plan that factored in the skill level of the workers or the robots on site at any moment. The effect was something like magic and something like ritual humiliation. If you installed something wrong, the system tried to find a way to work around your stupid mistake. Failing that, the system buzzed your haptics with rising intensity, and if you ignored them, it tried optical and even audible. If you squelched that, it started telling other humans that something was amiss and instructed them to fix it. This had been, there'd been a lot of A-B splitting of this. It was there in the code base and its unit test for anyone to review. And the most successful strategy the buildings had found for correcting humans was to pretend that they didn't exist. If you planted a piece of structural steel in a way that the building really couldn't work with and ignored the rising chorus of warnings, someone else would be told that there was a piece of misaligned materiel and tasked to it with high urgency. It was the same error that the buildings generated if something slipped. The error didn't assume that a human being had fucked up through malice or incompetence. The initial theory had been that an error without a responsible party would be more socially graceful. People doubled down on their mistakes, especially when they were embarrassed in front of their peers. The name and shame alternate versions had shown that hot-cheeked, fierce denial was the biggest impediment to standing up any building. So, if you fucked up, soon someone would turn up with a mecha or a forklift or a screwdriver and a job ticket to unfuck the thing that you were percussively maintaining into submission. You could pretend that you were doing the same job as the new guy, part of the solution instead of the problem's cause. This let you say face that you, so that you wouldn't insist that you were right and the building's stupid instructions and everything else in the stupid universe was wrong. Reality was truly weirder in a way that Limpopo loved. It turned out that if you were dispatched to defubar something that's, uh, and found someone who is obviously the source of that infubarage, you could completely tell that that structural steel was not three degrees off true because uh, of slippage. It was three degrees off true because some dipshit flubbed it. What's more, Senor Dipshit knew that you knew that he was at fault. But the fact that the job ticket read, urgent, re-true structural member, minus three degrees at 120 degrees north-northeast, and not urgent, re-true structural member, minus three degrees at 120 degrees north-northeast because some dipshit can't follow instructions, let both of you do this mannered kabuki in which you operated in the third-person passive voice. The beam became off true, not you fucked up the beam. That premise, the researchers called it networked social disattention, but everyone else called it the how did that get there effect, was a vital shift in the UNHCR's distributed shelter initiative. Prior to that, it had all been gamified to fuckery with leaderboards for the most correct installs and the best looters. Test builds were marred by angry confrontations and fistfights. Even this was a virtue, since every build would fissure into two or three subgroups, put each putting up their own building. It was three for the price of one. Inevitably, these forked-off buildings would be less ambitious than the initial plan. So early sites had a characteristic look, a flat, wide, low building, the first three stories of something that had been planned for 10 before half the workers quit. A hundred meters away, three more buildings, each half the size of the first, representing the forked and reforked buildings, revenge built by alienated splitters. Some sites had Fibonacci spirals of ever smaller forks terminating in a single hostility radiating hate built Wendy house. The buildings made the leap from UNHCR repo to the walkaways and mutated into innumerable variations beyond the clinic, school, shelter, refugee tri uh, triptych. The Belt and Braces was the first tavern ever attempted. Layouts for restaurant kitchens were, weren't far off from camp kitchens. And big common spaces, they were easy enough. But the actual zeitgeist of the thing was substantially different, tweaked in a thousand different ways so that you'd never walk into it and say, huh, this is a refugee residence that's been converted into a restaurant. 
but you'd never mistake the belt and braces for a normal restaurant. Its major feature was the projection map lighting that painted surface, surfaces and items throughout its interior with subtle red-green tones telling you where something was uh, needed human attention. This was the UNHCR playbook too, but again, there was a world of difference between dishing up MREs to climate refuse and serving fancy dry ice cocktails made from wet printers and powdered alcohol. No refugee camp ever went through quite so many cocktail parasols and perfect knot swizzle sticks. On an average day, the belt and braces served a couple hundred people. On Sundays, it was more like 500. The influx of noobs brought scouts for talent, sexual partners, bandmates, playmates, and of course, victims. Being the first one through the door meant that Limpopo would get to play Mater D. The assay showed that last night's beer had come up well. The hydrogen cells were running 45%, which would run the belt and braces for two weeks flat out. The egg beaters on the roof had been running hard, electrolyzing wastewater and pumping cracked hydrogen into the cells. There were 50 cells in the basement, harvested out of abandoned jets the drones had spotted. The jets hadn't been airworthy in a long time, but had yielded quantities of materiel for the belt and braces, including dozens of benches made from their seats. The hard-wearing upholstery had come clean, its dirt-shedding surfaces revealing designs with each wipe of their rags like reappearing, disappearing ink. But the hydrogen cells, they'd been the biggest find of all. Without them, the belt and braces would have been very different, prone to shortages and brownouts. Limpopo fretted that they'd be stolen, and it took all her self-control not to install surveillance wear around the utility hatches. The pre-prep stuff on the larders showed green, but she still made a point of personally sniffing the cheese cultures and prodding the dough through its kneading film. The sauce precursor smelled tasty, and the ice cream maker hummed as it lazily aerated the frozen cream. She called for coffee and sat, skewered, on a beam of light in the middle of the commons as the delicious, fruity, musky aroma wafted into the room. The first cup of coffee danced hot in her mouth, and its early-onset ingredients percolated into her bloodstream through the mucous membranes under her tongue. Her fingertips and scalp tingled, and she closed her eyes to enjoy the effects that the second-wave substances brought on as her gut started to work. Her hearing became preternatural. The big muscles in her quads and pecs and shoulders got a fiery feeling like dancing while standing still. She took another deep draft and closed her eyes, and when she opened them again, she had company. They were such obvious noobs that they could have come from central casting. And worse, they were schleppers. Their heavily outsized packs, many pocketed trekking coats and cargo pants stuffed to bulging. They looked overinflated. Schleppers were neurotic and probably destined to walk back within weeks, leaving behind lingering interpersonal up in their wake. Limpopo had gone walk away the right way with nothing more than clean underwear, which turned out to be superfluous. She tried not to prejudge these three, especially in the giddy first five minutes of her coffee and buzz. She didn't want a harsher mellow. Welcome to the B&B, she shouted louder than intended. They flinched and then rallied. Hi there, the girl said and walked forward. Her clothes were beautiful, bias cut and contrast stitched. Limpopo immediately coveted them. She'd pull the girl's images from the archives later and decompose the patterns and run a set for herself. She'd be the envy of all who saw her until the design propagated and became old news. Sorry to just walk in, but we heard... You heard right! Limpopo's voice was quieter, but still too shouty. Either the coffee had to burn down so that she could control her affect, or she needed to drink a lot more so she could stop giving a shit. She thumped the refill zone and put her cup under the nozzle. Open to everyone all day every day, but Sundays are special. Our way of saying hello to our new neighbors and getting to know them. I'm Limpopo. What do you want to be called? The phrasing was particular to the walkaways, an explicit invitation to remake yourself. It was the height of walkaway sophistication to greet people with it, and Limpopo used it t deliberately on these three because she could tell that they were tightly wound. The shorter of the two guys, with a scruffy kinked beard and a stubbly shaved head, stuck his hand out. I'm Gizmo Von Puddleducks. This is Zombie McDingleberry and etc. The other two rolled their eyes. Thank you, Gizmo, the girl said, but actually you can call me Stable Strategies. 
The, the other guy, tall but hunched over with an owlish expression and exhaustion lines on his face, said, You might as well call me, etc. Thanks, Herr von Puddleducks. Very pleased to meet, Limpopo said. Why don't you put your stuff down and grab a seat, and I'll get you some coffee, I'm okay? So that's the reading. And now I'm going to talk a little... Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little about abundance and scarcity here. Um, so without realizing it, I uh, wrote this triptych of uh, abundance and scarcity novels. Uh, my first novel, Down in the Magic Kingdom, came out in 2003. And I like to think of this as the scarcity abundance novel that has the most to do with uh, John Maynard Keynes, specifically this paper he wrote in 1930 called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. Uh, he predicted that by 2028, our production would be so efficient that we could have all of our material wants met in just a few days' work every week, and that our biggest problem would be figuring out what to do with all the empty hours left behind by attaining uh, sort of universal luxury. And um, Keynes was right in one important sense. Keynes was right because he, uh, anticip because he did correctly anticipate that we would ramp up our productivity until we could produce with an, ab an abundance that would have alarmed and delighted our grandparents. What he was wrong about was the demand elasticity, just how much people might actually want if there was more available, and, and, and how much we might end up wanting someday, and whether or not our wants could always outstrip what we could make. And it seems like we've managed to want a lot more than our grandparents wanted. So even though today we live in an era of enormous abundance by the standards of Keynes in 32, we still uh, want more and we have some problems with uh, distribution of what we have, which I'm going to get to in a moment. And then in 2009, I wrote this novel called Makers. Uh, Makers uh, is a book that I think of as being related in some way to uh, a, an influential paper from 1972 uh, published by the Club of Rome called Limits to Growth. Uh, this was the the paper in which they started to take account of just how much material input went into the kinds of things that Keynes had been talking about in 32. They said, like, look, if we're going to give everyone a car by 2028, we multiply the amount of steel in a car by the number of people we anticipate having by 2028, and then we subtract the amount of steel that we think the Earth has, and there's a steel deficit. We just don't have the material to live like they do in, uh, it, it, like they would in, 20, in, in 2028 as they did in, in 1932 with universal distribution of luxury. Um, and against that, we have observed that markets uh, can do one thing very efficiently, which is reduce the material inputs to the kinds of things that we uh, commonly use, pointing to a potential solution. Uh, so um, there's a, a paper called uh, IKEA Product P Pricing and Pass-Through uh, published by a Canadian and an American uh, scholar, both of them economists. So the story goes that this Canadian economist um, saved IKEA catalogs, and his spouse said that he needed to do something with them or she would throw them away. So he decided to do a study on uh, what the predictors were for long-term uh, inclusion in an IKEA catalog of a particular design. And what they discovered by using these old IKEA catalogs as a data set is that uh, designs that persist through time in the IKEA product line become lighter over time. They have fewer material inputs over time. They also have, uh, occupy less cubic volume. They become more efficiently packed, as famously in computer science, figuring out the best way to uh, decompose something and pack it with the least space is a problem we call MP-complete, the knapsack problem. You can never fully solve it. And so if there are some tractable uh, mathematics that allows you to pack the same thing into fewer, uh, into less space, uh, it also predicts that it's going to persist. And, and finally, the number of countries of manufacture also declines. So the, uh, the kind of material complexity, the logistical complexity, you can think of some of these as being proxies for the, the uh, labor inputs as well go down. And this is a pattern that we observe in many, in fact, most manufactured goods. You know, if you think about this building, which is a relatively recent vintage, vi recent enough that it has this clunky name that has a two in it, um, and you compare it to I don't know, one of the fake Gothic buildings uh, with its buttresses on the Harvard campus. And you think about just how much that building weighs and how much this building weighs and how much cubic footage it encloses and how much that building 
encloses, and you just calculate a simple ratio, you'll find that even over the relatively brief period, since Harvard was pretending it was the Middle Ages and building fake medieval buildings, and today we have made enormous material gains uh, in our ability to produce the same, effectively the same goods, but with fewer material inputs. If you Literally, if you take two Billy bookcases, one from 10 years ago and one from today, and you stand them beside each other, Although they're the same height and the same depth and they, have the same, and they look the same, they're very different animals and they represent great breakthroughs in material science and in our ability to construct. And so uh, maybe the answer to the Club of Rome and to limits to growth and to this idea that if we were going to give everyone the lifestyle of the Fed West, uh, we would need six planet Earth's worth of material to do it, is that we just reduce the material inputs into our life cycle by five six, and then we attain material abundance. And then I wrote this third book, this book that came out last year, called Walk Away. Uh, Walk Away draws on a number of, of uh, recent books, uh, nonfiction books, about thinking in uh, alternative and heterodox economics, as well as in theories of human action. Um, and I'm going to take you through a few of these. Uh, the first one is this book by Paul Mason called Post-Capitalism. Uh, Mason is trying to do that trick that Ursula Le Guin exhorted us to do, to imagine a world without capitalism, uh, to kind of push back against the Thatcherite motto that there is no alternative and, and to imagine an alternative. I think that, generally speaking, if someone as asserts that there is no alternative, what they're doing is disguising an ob uh, a demand as an observation. When Margaret Thatcher said there is no alternative, what she meant is stop trying to think of alternatives. Um, so Mason's trying to think of alternatives. He's trying to imagine how we might use networks to allocate resources instead of markets. Right? I mentioned before that markets have done this neat trick of reducing the material, labor, and energy inputs into our, our physical goods. He says, well, what could we do without markets? So one of the observations he makes is that we have these giant companies that don't have internal markets that are incredibly efficient at allocating resources. So he uses the example of Amazon. And he invites us to imagine what a non-market-driven Amazon would be able to do uh, if you separated it from market logic but kept intact its allocation capacity. So, because obviously Amazon doesn't, although it, it provides markets for other people, if you uh, get hired by Jeff Bezos and you want to figure out where you're going to sit, there isn't a system of bids and puts that you use to bid against your fellow managers to decide which desk you're going to get. Right? Jeff Bezos plays central committee, creates the five-year plan, and tells you where you're going to sit, allocates your pencils and erasers and laptop and cloud computing password to you, uh, and he sits there and plays commissar to your extremely efficient planned economy. So that was one book that I found very influential. And then there was this other one uh, by Leigh Phillips that's even more provocative, uh, Austerity Ecology, uh, uh, Austerity Ecology and the Collapse Porn Addicts uh, by Leigh Phillips. Uh, Phillips is a Canadian-British science writer. He's kind of a rock star science writer. You'll see him gracing the cover of Nature or Science at least once or twice a year uh, with a major story. And he says he's not a Marxist, but he sure wrote a Marxist book here. Um, and in particularly, it's a Marxist book that is taking aim at what he calls the green left. Uh, the idea that the, uh, the way forward to a better world is to dismantle not only capitalism, but the things that capitalism has built. And he points out that at one point, the left was a Promethean movement, that it promised that not only would you have a chicken in every pot, but that we could have rocket ships in every spaceport, and that we could have uh, robots that ran our factories, and that we wouldn't run around wringing our hands about what would happen when robots made us obsolete. We would run around uh, dreaming dreams about what would happen when robots made our jobs obsolete, and how wonderful it would be when all of those jobs were things that robots did, and then humans could realize their full potential. And Phillips, he goes beyond imagining uh, a post-capitalist uh, Amazon. He invites us to imagine a post-capitalist Walmart. And if there's a command, command economy in American business or global business right now, it's Walmart. I mean, much more so than, than Jeff Bezos, who has all kinds of modern ideas from his days in a hedge fund. The Walton family run Walmart uh, like uh, uh, a family tyranny business, you know, your basic family tyranny business where they hand out orders and if you don't like them, uh, it's their way or the highway. And there's certainly not internal markets to allocate resources there. And they certainly are extremely efficient at getting resources from uh, China to the rest of the world. 
And if you imagine that we stop wringing our hands about what happens when Foxconn replaces all those um, women who move from Fujian and Hunan province to Guangzhou and Shenzhen uh, with robots, and we start celebrating their liberation from bondage, and imagine that all of those Happy Meal toys are being made by robots, and that they're being fired at the port of Los Angeles at the rate of one container per second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and being offloaded by robots and then allocated without having to have markets, you start to imagine a world in which you end up with a uh, very different kind of resource allocation, scarcity, and abundance question. Which brings me to the last thing that influenced me that I'm going to talk about today when uh, I wrote uh, Walk Away. And that's this paper here uh, that Ronald Coase wrote before winning the uh, Not a Nobel Prize in Economics uh, in 1937, The Nature of the Firm. So Coase uh, is a legendary economist, died fairly recently. He was updating this paper, as I, I discovered when I started looking for a nice design, uh, uh, you know, an old PDF of it to, to stick in this slide. Turns out that he was revising this paper all the way up to, I think, the early 2000s. But uh, what he proposes is that um, the reason that the, the most important thing to think about when we think about groups and institutions is not why we form them, but how they allocate labor, how they, how they coordinate labor. So the thing that it, you want to attend to when you're thinking about the Catholic Church or the Mafia or ISIS or the U.S. government or Walmart or Amazon or Tor Books or uh, this university is how they coordinate the labor of all the people who produce something that is literally superhuman, more than one person could produce on their own, uh, and how they stop one person from unknitting the sweater that someone else is busily knitting down the other end. And um, the thing that networks have given us more than anything else, more than anything uh, in the history of our technologies, is the ability to coordinate labor with fewer and fewer institutions, less institutional overhead. So it used to be that if we wanted to make an operating system or a, uh, an encyclopedia, that we would have these big command and control structures where individuals had to uh, give up their individual autonomy, take orders from on high, and uh, work in lockstep uh, to ensure that no one was rewriting something that someone else was working on, that there was little duplication of effort, that people were, weren't working at cross purposes and so on. And today we make operating systems and encyclopedias the way ants build hills, right? We, we have these uh, network structures like wikis and Git repositories where literally you can take a bit of labor that you think might be useful to someone's grand project. You just sort of throw it on the scaffolding, not literally actually, figuratively. You throw it on the scaffolding and it kind of clings there. And then someone else throws another glob of their labor onto that scaffolding and it clings there. And sometimes the globs meet up and they form a bigger glob, and that becomes a useful unit. And then those globs attract more globs, like kind of like if you can imagine sort of slow-moving mercury dripping off the branches of this, of this weird ramified tree that is a Git repository, a wiki, what have you. People are adding branches, people are adding globs, people are pruning branches and merging them together. It's ugly, it's messy, they shout at each other, they find each other's phone numbers and send SWAT teams to each other's houses. But... It's also something that requires a lot less institutional overhead than anything we've ever had before. And I think that this has something to do with the uh, rise and rise of steampunk across the uh, digital era. In fact, uh, one of my former Clarion students, uh, not Clarion here, Clarion West in Seattle, a guy named, uh, uh, sorry, a non-binary person now named uh, Magpie L uh, Killjoy, had this magazine called Steampunk. And their motto was, love the machine, hate the factory. And I think that Magpie really captured the soul of steampunk with this motto because what they were saying is that the, the wonderful thing about steampunk is that it imagines the industrial revolution in which we had this incredible leap forward in productivity where we went from like if you were lucky you had a single set of clothes and when you washed it you couldn't go out of doors until it dried off to everyone having an, a, a material abundance relative to the pre-industrial age, even the poorest people having a material abundance relative to the pre-industrial age. But um, steampunk imagines it in the heroic artisanal mode of production. So rather than having to give up 
the ability to decide when and how you're going to work. If you imagine, you know, making a door before the assembly line, if it's a crisp autumn day, you step outside and you, uh, you know, shellac because that's a thing you do out of doors when there's not a lot of, when, when you've got a breeze that can bring the fumes away. But when it rains, you move indoors and you sand. And then on days when you're not feeling it, you make cider, right? If you're on the uh, if you're on the assembly line making doors, making doors that everybody can afford, so everybody gets a door, you get a door, and you get a door, and you get a door, and you're like, the weather's nice outside today. I'm just gonna take a break from the old assembly line and step outside and you know watch the leaves turn. Uh, the assembly line grinds to a halt, and what steampunk imagined was all the autonomy of the artisan and all the productivity of the industrial age, and that's kind of what Coase gets at when you think about an information economy is that an information economy, one in which we have this incredibly efficient coordinative technology, technology that allows us to work in our own way and have the positive externalities of our labor accrue into a commons that everyone draws from, that gives us all this kind of uh, mutual, uh, broadly shared prosperity of information resources that um, you can imagine that you, you can combine the material efficiencies of, uh, of, of um, the IKEA lesson of makers and the uh, allocation uh, and desire uh, um, uh, elements of Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom with this coordinative efficiency and come up with something that is uh, uh, pretty close to what some science fiction writers have called fully automated luxury communism, also something that some political thinkers have been talking about. And there's, there's a book that describes that too. Uh, this book from 2005 by Bruce Sterling, Shaping Things, is a, an incredibly prescient pamphlet from MIT Press about how we might manufacture things in the information age. And Sterling says, we might end up with objects that uh, only come into existence when they're needed. So if you need a drill, you print or make or, 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 or locate that drill. And that drill mostly exists as information until it's needed. Then it becomes a physical object. While it's a physical object, it gathers information about its usage that can be used to improve that drill. And then it gracefully decomposes back into the part stream, into the material stream, until the next time someone needs a drill. And then it's reinstantiated as a better drill. And drills are a really good example, because if you're like me, you have a drill in a drawer, because once or twice a year you need to make a hole. And you don't have like the second best drill. You don't have the 11th best drill. You have a drill that is like the minimum viable drill, right? A drill that is like a, I you know there's no polite way of saying it, a piece of shit that you keep in a drawer that exists only because not owning a drill is only slightly worse than owning that drill, right? or a lawnmower, right? You have a lawnmower even here in Southern California, even where it, the parts of Southern California we pretend that we, we've never heard of the drought. Even so, you're not using your lawnmower more than weekly unless there's something wrong with you, right? And more likely fortnightly or monthly. And so you don't have the world's greatest lawnmower. Chances are, unless you're a grass enthusiast, you have the minimum viable lawnmower too. So imagine a kind of fully automated luxury communism version of, uh, of, of Zipcar, right? One in which the moment at which you need a lawnmower, that lawnmower trundles up, and it's the best lawnmower we can imagine. And rather than uh, uh, feeling like it's a hardship that you're enduring the opportunity cost of having this greasy spot uh, beneath a, a lawnmower in your garage that you hate using and that you only use periodically, um, and, and, but nevertheless, you, you feel like it's the, the alternative would be a hardship, it would be not owning a lawnmower. Instead, you celebrate the fact that you don't need to own a goddamn lawnmower, that the lawnmower p brings itself into your presence when you need it and takes itself away gracefully when you're done. And that's, I think, the future that bridges all of these other problems. Because you might note that even though IKEA studies tell us that we can make enough stuff for everyone, and even though we're now thinking about... Um, the philosophical underpinnings of what we want. You know, Mary Kondo has built a career out of trying to convince everyone that all they really need is a single smooth river rock that reminds them of their mother. Uh, you know, even with all of that, we still have this grotesque inequality, like guillotine grade inequality in our world. And so what we have 
is not just a desire problem and not just a production problem, but we have an allocation problem. And imagining uh, a, a world beyond markets, a world where markets are seen as a tool rather than as an arbiter of your moral worth, is, uh, is a way of imagining a, um, a future in which maybe all three of those elements of scarcity and abundance can be, can be bridged. Um, but there is a paradox because uh, this model of uh, sufficiency, of abundance, only works under conditions of relative equality in which people have political agency and social, uh, social power. Otherwise, this just becomes an extension of what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism, where that drill that is trying to figure out how you're using it in order to be a better drill is also spying on you to figure out how to convince you to drill more holes, right? Uh, and also spying on you to figure out how much a hole is worth to you so it can titrate the pricing in an exciting, dynamic way to ensure that you pay as much as possible for every hole you make. So um, ultimately, Walkaway isn't just a novel about allocation or a novel about uh, production. It's a novel about how we use technology as something that people program rather than as something that programs people. Thank you very much. So Michael, you have some questions. Yes, uh, well, Shall we yeah, move to the we'll uh, saunter? There we, there we are. go. Okay. Um, I made some notes. Um, thank you for that. That was really lovely. And uh, I'm curious, when you talk about the economy of, of the sort of the wiki economy, this sort of this commons of the globs and the mercury and, mm -hmm. and the way we have an, kind of an information economy, um, and I'm thinking about the, the relationship between your visit and the exhibition we, you just saw and that many of yeah. us have seen. And Which I, I recommend to all of you. It's just outside the door as you leave. Right, I ran around the corner of the gallery. Thank you. A network error. Uh, in that exhibition, one of the one of the things that we see is the way in which rage is expressed in public, and the way in which scale is a is a kind of metaphor, a mechanism of expressing that. And I guess in this economy of information, wherein we all uh, we all now and speculatively in your fiction we all have this ability to engage and interact. How do we efficiently express rage? Oh, yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, you know, um, there's this whole delete Facebook movement yeah. uh, now where, where people are trying to, um, trying to push back against the social norm that you have to submit to surveillance in order to have a social life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's obviously the whole uh, kind of angry dude culture and angry mm -hmm. everyone culture on the internet. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess what I'll say is that uh, some of this comes with the maturity of the technology. And I always think of Hieronymus Bosch paintings because we had a century in which the relatively innocuous technology of distilling gin Mm -hmm. was like literally a vision from hell, right? <laughs> yeah. it, was a, it was a tough century. In fact, yeah. uh, my, my editor at Tor, Patrick Nielsen Hayden, often points out that we spend about a century getting used to technologies. And, you know, the Scandies had the good luck to get used to booze when nothing very important was happening. And the Russians had the bad luck to have to get used to booze in the 19th century mm -hmm. when there was a bunch of stuff going on and it was to their great detriment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I think that, like... One of the lessons of a Hieronymus Bosch painting is that uh, stimulus regresses to the mean, that the, the, uh, the extent to which we are empowered by the speed of networks and their characteristics to be dicks to each other yeah. is uh, something that may endure, but all the evidence is that these things mellow over time. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, like anyone who has... Uh, Who's, who's paid $800 to see Hamilton, knows that at one point, <laughs> writing stuff in the newspaper got you shot, right? Uh, that may be the case today in Ethiopia and, and the former Soviet Union, but it's, it's not our primary means by which people get you know, doxxed and, and swatted today because of angry denunciations in the editorial, the editorial pages. Right, yeah. yeah, so 
I think that like over time we get better at it. And in the meantime, some of the the stuff that we're seeing now is actually probably positive. So Dana Boyd, who's a sociologist who studies how vulnerable kids, you mostly uh, poor kids, marginalized kids, and uh, queer kids and kids of color use networks. Mm -hmm. She spent 15 years doing this, wrote a great dissertation. It's a book called It's Complicated. It's open access mm -hmm. from MIT Press. Um, she talks about how bullying has always been with us, but it's been invisible to adults. And that a lot of what we attribute to the surge in bullying is the surge in the visibility of right. bullying. And that for people who struggle to get the adults in their lives to take action on bullying, at least the visibility makes it something that we can do something about. Yeah, police brutality as well. Yeah, yeah, police brutality is another good example, yeah. But I don't have an answer about what the best way to express rage is. I, you know, one of the things that, I, uh, that we've observed is that effective ways to create uprisings uh, also regress to the mean. So, mm -hmm. you know, the SOPA moment in which we made 8 million phone calls to Congress in 72 hours over a bad internet bill terrified Congress. We capped that number in the net neutrality fight. And while it's alarming and amazing to think that 87% of Americans have a positive view of something as weird and esoteric right. as net neutrality, <laughs> yeah. it certainly wasn't the kind of political earthquake yeah. that SOPA was. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, what happened was that it was, you know, once is, once is amazing. Mm -hmm. The second time, it's, it's like, it's like watching a magician do the same trick twice, yeah. you know? Yeah. It gets a lot less interesting. Right. I'm speaking to someone who's like mastered three magic tricks oh. and whose family is really tired of watching me make two, <laughs> two seemingly unlinked rubber bands link themselves. Yeah. I'm here to tell you, they the get less impressive time over time. It was pretty though. great yeah. the first yeah. time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, on the flip side of the, of the rage question, I guess, is something that in your, in your novel Walk Away really struck me. One of the reasons uh, among many that I, that I enjoyed it so much, but I think the reason it was, it's, a, it's radical in some ways, is that um, a character like Lin Popo or uh, many of the characters in the novel are, are sort of, um, let's say, fully embodied in their desire for each other, mm -hmm. whether that be uh, as lovers or as friends and that love and desire are really present and foregrounded in the narrative. And I think that in a, in a book that's about revolution and about DIY and about information technology, that's, that's rarer than, hmm. than not. Uh, Annalee Newitz's Autonomous also has that kind of desire. And I guess what I'm curious about is that if, if you talked about desire in your lecture is desire for um, means of production and desire for uh, raw materials to build, uh, whether that be infrastructurally or architecturally. But where is this, in your thinking about mm -hmm. both fiction and culturally, where is this um, relationship between uh, the material scarcity and reactions to it in the information technology and desire and embodiment as sort of side effects of that? Meaning, if, if we are meant to be uh, buying and selling or making and <sighs> trading is the, in the information technology, where is the role of, our, of this other softer thing that you wrote about in the novel? Where does that show up in, uh, in that new economy? Well, you know, one of the um, observations that has been made both, both as a positive and a negative about networks mm -hmm. since the earliest days is their ability to allow people to find others who share their quirks, yeah. right? Um, you know, I... I so I dropped out of four undergraduate programs, and the last university I didn't get a degree from was the University of Waterloo, where I proposed a, a dissertation in the Interdisciplinary Studies program. It was a, it was an, you know, you had to do a fourth-year project on deviant sociology and the internet, mm -hmm. and it was at this moment in which AT and T was running these these this ad campaign called the You Will campaign. It was for ISDN, right? And it was, have you ever tucked your child <laughs> you in from six thousand miles away? You will. <laughs> Have you right. ever attended a meeting from your kitchen? You will. Yeah. And what they were doing is stressing all the ways in which the internet would make us more normal. Mm -hmm. And I was like, have you ever found someone else who thinks that dressing up like a lizard before having sex is cool? You, you will, will yeah. right? <laughs> and the internet clearly made it possible for us to be weird, yeah. right? In ways that like previously things like science fiction fandom had presaged. Sure. And you know, I think that it's not an accident. I think that the the internet um, replicates some of science fiction's uh, networked 
culture of mm. esoteric interest uh, and was also the first, it was the first non-technical activity on the internet where science fiction discussion groups mm -hmm. and science fiction fandom and network engineering has this huge overlap because of this, right? Because yeah. the internet allows you to find all the people who are spread out over the world who have interests like yours for better and for worse, yeah. right? So it's, it's, the, it's the origin of color revolutions. Mm -hmm. It's why Me Too is happening. It's why people sure. who are yeah. trans and queer are able to come out. It's how movements for social justice in general have mobilized. It's very hard, especially in repressive environments where you face reprisals mm -hmm. for, uh, for coming out about any minority view or um, uh, activity or trait about yourself that isn't immediately mm -hmm. obvious. It allows you to come out in ways that are uh, controllable by you. And, and you know we do live in this like remarkable moment, right? Like in living memory, there are people alive today who would have gone to jail for being people to the mar to, to for being married to the people they're married to? And there's children alive today who would have been illegal if they had been born in living memory. And we went from that to gay marriage, to inter er, interracial marriage, to the abolition of sodomy laws, and so on. We did that in a in a lifespan. And the way that that happened was by each person who was in that. Uh, who, who was in that group was able to choose the time and manner of their disclosure to the people around them mm -hmm. to talk to them about this. A moment in which it was like optimal from their view for enlisting those people. Now maybe they get it wrong, right? We've sure, all had sure, stories sure. about yeah. that. But, sh but that ability to choose time and manner of disclosure was how they built the alliance that quietly percolated through the, through the world, through their nations, mm -hmm. and allowed that change to happen. And unless you think that in 50 years, your grandchildren are going to say, tell me again, Grandpa, how it was that back in 2018 we had solved all of our social problems and haven't changed any of our social norms since. Then you have to understand that there's people you love who today have a secret in their heart that brings them sorrow every day. And they dream of the day that they can tell you of it. And if we don't have a space in which they can talk about that anonymously, choose the, find the, the, the culture and the community that lets them figure out how to come out to the people around them. Unless we preserve that space, those people will die with that sorrow in their hearts, mm -hmm. never having come to you, and you will have never fully known them. And your ignorance of their problems will have been a, a source of, of, of sorrow for them for all of their days, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the upside, is that the internet alleviates those sorrows. The downside is that, you know, if you're Milo Yiannopoulos, one in a hundred thousand people in the world is broken enough to hear your message and have it resonate with you. And if you are enough of a shocking jerk, then everyone else will run around shouting, did you hear what Milo said? Until it falls on the ear of one of those hundred thousand people, right? So he can use us as force multipliers or as reflection attack yeah. uh, uh, infrastructure to reach this audience too. And ultimately, I think that the ability to find the people you enlist to your cause mm -hmm. is a source for good, even though there are causes I disagree with. You know, I, and I, I remain baffled and sometimes delighted, but often <coughs> dismayed by the causes that turn out to have enough people to form a critical mass. Yeah. The Flat Earth Movement, right? right? I mean, that's not a joke, right? No. The Flat Earth Movement is it's part real. of this, this real conspiracy theory it's part, you know, if uh, I recommend a podcast to you called Oh No, Ross and Kerry, uh, um, hosted by these two uh, Southern California comedians mm -hmm. who are ex-evangelicals mm -hmm. and who join fringe groups every oh. week <laughs> in a spirit of, uh, a spirit of uh, open inquiry. Yeah. <laughs> they're trying to find the parts of that, the, of, of being in a fringe group that they enjoyed, yeah. but they're also looking at it from a kind of factual basis. So they spent a weekend at a Flat Earth conference mm -hmm. And then they interviewed the rock star of flat earth philosophy <laughs> and it chilled me to my bones. Yeah. It sounds like a joke, but it is like, it, it's dead serious. Yeah. There are people who genuinely no fooling believe in flat earth. And it's, you know, it's not, it's, it's weirder than crystal healing. It's weirder than Reiki. It's weirder than fairies down the bottom of the garden. All worked out. It's yeah. It's weirder than hollow earth. Yeah. You know, it is like it, it is, bananas yeah. and there is this group of people who've rejected everything and found other people who reject everything right. to hang out and reject everything with yeah you know 
Uh, the next short story I write is going to be about um, bereaved parents and terminally ill people who have been denied coverage by their uh, medical insurers who become suicide bombers oh. and start blowing up um, health uh, insurers uh, as a kind of parable about this. Yeah. Wow. Well, that was a great answer to my not so great question, and I appreciate it. Um, you really nailed it. Let me um, open it up. I feel yeah. like I've asked you enough. So can we call like alternately on people who identify as women and non-binary and people who identify as male or non-binary? There is a microphone there. And there's a microphone, a microphone over there. here as well. So if you'd like to be and heard. And we have a runner. I'll look at that. If there's a woman or non-binary person who'd like to start us off. Which is a bigger waste of time and energy, mining Bitcoin or mining gold? Well, gold is a useful ductile metal that is both decorative and has industrial applications. But nobody has a use for a pound of gold. Uh, there's probably 16 people who have a use for an ounce each of gold. <laughs> is, that, is that how many ounces there are in a pound? I, I'm, I'm a metric, I'm Canadian, so oh, yeah. do I have that right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you have it right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, 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 right. Given enough t enough gold, you can make a toilet for the White House. David, did you? Is there a woman out there? Yeah, preventing these good things is a very large um, objective of an oligarchic putsch that's spreading around the world. Could you define for us the difference between those people who have attained intellectual or a lot of financial power in the world who emphasize relative wealth um, versus those who emphasize absolute wealth? And do you agree that that's a divider between those who are elites and want this yeah. and those who are elites who want to restore the feudal hierarchies that are in our genes? So I, I uh, actually had some firsthand experience of this last year. I went to the World Economic Forum uh, in Davos and heard firsthand the pitch that I'd heard secondhand from a lot of kind of acolytes, but I heard it from the high priesthood, which goes like this. Yes, there's lots more, there's lots of people in dollar a day poverty, but a dollar a day poverty is not what it once was, that between sanitation and networks and, um, and uh, efficiencies in production, a dollar a day looks a lot more like the, you know, a courtier in the court of the, the Sun King than it does like the peasants grubbing in the fields in rural France at the time. And there is something to that. It is undeniable that one of the benefits of technology is that it allows uh, for a higher standard of living with fewer material energy and labor inputs. And so that is a, a hugely democratizing force. And so the theory goes, the reason that, that people who are very wealthy stress this is that the other half of the equation is we made that. Our markets made those efficiencies. And unless you uh, allow for the inequality, the efficiencies will not emerge. And, you will, um, and so we'll still have poor people, but being poor will mean that two-thirds of your children die before they're two, and half of all women die in childbirth, as opposed to it meaning that a small elite have uh, you know mansions and everyone else has shacks, but those shacks all have solar panels and mm. purified water and you know automatically delivered uh, educational curriculum. And I think that there's two important rejoinders to this notion. The first is that when power is concentrated into a small number of hands, the follies of those people are magnified, right? That mm. that it's one thing to have a weird idea like the flat Earth. Right? right. It's another thing to have a weird idea like the flat Earth and be a billionaire, right? And so you see echoes of this in the paranoid style in American politics, where we talk about the Cokes and Soros and so on. Be and what we're really saying is that the the outsized effect of the follies and blind spots of these the small number of people uh, are rippling out across us. Zuckerberg is a really good example of mm -hmm. this. Mark Zuckerberg, who you know. Um, famously was telling sociologists about 12 years ago that anyone who insists that they have a different presentation of themselves to different people is two-faced and socially dishonest and that what Facebook will do is 
bring out our best selves by forcing us to present the same face to everyone, the same face to your lover as your grandmother, the same face to your boss as your baby. Uh, and, you know, I think he regrets this now, not, not saying it, I th uh, not, not believing it. I think he regrets publicly avowing it. Um, and that folly, that idea that really, like, you know, the reason that sociologists kept asking him this question is that sociologists and psychologists pretty much universally think that this was, this is a really stupid thing to say. And they just, it was like, it was like a, a magic trick, right? You could ask Mark Zuckerberg to say white was black, up was down, you know, pi was equal to three, right? Tell me again, Mark, about your theory of social interaction. Oh, everyone should have just one face that they present to everyone. That's, that's a good theory yeah. of interest. So, and they'd be like, yeah. really? And he'd be like, yep. And so, you know, for them, it was kind of a party trick. And now, you know, I think in retrospect, we see some of the consequences of that. But, you know, you can see it on a broader level, like with climate denial, right? There is a small number of people for whom climate denial is an incredibly convenient thing to believe in, right? And like anything that's really convenient, you should, you should feel a little, to believe in, you should feel a little trepidatious about because those beliefs may be wrong. Um, or, you know, a, another good example would be Saudi Arabia, right? You know, excluding the 52% of their population from full participation in civic and political life surely has consequences, right? There are, there are ardent Wahhabists who will die of cancers that uh, could have been cured by women who were denied access to full civic and political life. It is to their detriment that this folly has become their dominant ideology, and nevertheless, it persists, right? And so I think that that is the, that those, those two answers, right? That like decentralizing decision-making uh, is really important. And um, sorry, did I say the other one? No, decentralizing decision-making is one of them. Uh, and I forget what the other one was gonna be. Let's move on. Yeah. Speaking of billionaires with interesting ideas, um, I'm really fascinated by this movement in Silicon Valley to pursue immortality. Yeah. And we've got some people in this building who are hacking their bodies to um, see what happens. So how does that all fin fit in with this um, in terms of economy and um, some of the facets that you've been talking about? Well, I think that if like, so I, I think that uh, a lot of our technological predictions have an inconvenient statistical problem, which is that it's very hard to distinguish S-curves from J-curves uh, until th one of them levels off. So you don't know, if things are going like this, you don't know if they're about to do that or if they're just gonna go whoosh, right? And so a lot of our predictions about where biotechnology and um, uh, computational genomics and, and all of these other kind of very promising avenues are gonna end up are grounded in a, an essentially faith-based belief. Uh, but this is a recurring theme in technology. I mean, if, if you listen to the talk about AI, right, we don't know with machine learning. So, you know, AI is like, it's always been 20 years away. It's one of those technologies. It's always been 20 years away. We just, through a certain, you know, a certain set of techniques around machine learning, we're able to realize a bunch of really impressive gains. We don't know if we've exhausted those gains or if we've opened up a seam that has no bottom, you know, and whether we'll be able to mine them forever. And so I think that like, just first of all, as a technical matter, we should be skeptical of people who say we have this linear progression that, you know, or, or exponential progression that last year we've got this doubling curve and the doubling curve will never end, right? Doubling curves often end <laughs> and sometimes they end really messily, you know, because because it's hard to keep on doubling things. They, they, they you know, it's the parable of the chessboard or the lily pond or whatever, you know, the d doubling, the exponential curves are hard to get your head around, which is the argument of, of the people who claim that technology will give them immortality is like, you just don't understand how exponential exponential is. That's why you're skeptical. And and I think that it's it works equally, it cuts both ways. Um, as to, you know, uh, what it means. Um, Bruce Sterling uh, wrote another nonfiction book whose name I'm blanking on. Uh, so that one came out in 2005 and the next one was about 2009 uh, that, uh, where he talks about the potential for uh, effective speciation if it turns out that computational genomics does realize impressive gains. Because if we can start altering our germ plasm uh, using computational genomics, um, then what you end up with is that a, a, a bunch of common congenital 
conditions that uh, either shorten your life or reduce your quality of life or both mm-hmm. are eliminated from the germplasm of an assortively mated aristocracy and remain in the germplasm of everyone else. And in fact, this is one of the premises of, of Walkaway, that the MacGuffin that moves Walkaway along is that um, a bunch of research scientists who have sort of sold their souls to the super rich to create practical immortality have this kind of realization that they are speciating the human race and they steal Promethean fire and they, they bring it to the rest of the world and they open source it. And this is what provokes, this is what turns this walkaway culture from a kind of adorable bohemia right. that the rest of the world dotes on and likes to steal fashion tips from yeah. and into uh, a scourge that is going to be like eliminated with hellfire missiles because it's the realization that yes, you may end up being an immortal man like a god, but the rest of us are going to be hanging around beside you for all <laughs> of eternity as opposed to like disappearing in your rear view mirror <laughs> as you, as you, you know, age with the heat death of the universe. And so I, I don't know if that answers the question. I mean, those are kind of my general thoughts on it. Hi. Hi there. Um, I'd like your point of view on how we tackle the idea of misinformation and the propagation mm-hmm. of misinformation, and if you think there's any responsibility on anybody's part to regulate or to shape what we see in our news feeds. Um, where does that lie, um, and how do we, you know, how do we get people to, um, I guess better ju- be better judges of what goes out there, what goes, what kind of information they receive. It's a really good question, and it's a, it's in a class of hard technology problems that you know also things like how do we make computers secure, uh, and how do we prevent uh, states from abusing their authority, and how do we uh, know that what we're teaching is good. Um, you know those those are this this whole class of hard problems. And I propose that there's a framework for breaking off a piece of that problem that is very tractable, that l- leaves that that uh, doesn't solve the problem, but ensures that if there is a solution for the problem, it isn't hard. It is not made harder to find. And and here's the framework for it: it's that any step that we should that we take should not impair the ability of people to propose and test solutions, nor should we have any rule that prohibits disclosure of problems that we discover, right? So telling the truth about problems in the world should always be lawful. Trying to solve the problems you have should always be lawful. And the reason I bring this up is that it, that should be like a kind of motherhood and apple pie universal agreement, and it's not present in any of our solutions to any of these problems, right? So like if you think about computer security as a kind of broader case of which misinformation is a narrower piece. We have rules like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which dates back to 1986 in a panic over the movie War Games that makes it a felony (laughs) to violate the user license agreement of a website. So what that means is if, for example, you think that Facebook is showing you different ads based on your political affiliation and Facebook's um, license agreement prohibits fooling Facebook about what your political affiliation is by creating parallel accounts, one of which has one political affiliation, one of which has another, mm-hmm. to find out what Facebook is doing, you commit a potential felony, right? And so this is why uh, the ACLU and um, uh, ProPublica are suing the U.S. government uh, for the right to spoof websites to find out whether or not they're practicing criminal racial discrimination in advertising of financial products because the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act gets in the way of that. Um, It also gets in the way of remediating that problem. So like when Facebook started, it it entered a field crowded with other social networks, including an ascendant one called MySpace. And the way that Facebook uh, was able to bridge itself, its users between Facebook and MySpace is it offered them a halfway solution between being a Facebook user and a MySpace user. It gave you a bot that would load, log into MySpace on your behalf, scrape out the posts that your friends had made and put them in your Facebook wall, and then take your replies and put them back in MySpace and tell people, by the way, I answered this on, on Facebook. Why don't you come join me? Facebook just sued a competitor of theirs successfully called Power Ventures for violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for making a much more modest bot that just after you res- resigned from Facebook told your friends 
that you were using Power, Power Ventures rival network. So if you notice that Facebook is skewing the news you get and you want to write an alternative client for Facebook that uh, allows you to get different news out of Facebook, that allows you to survey how different people are seeing it, that allows you to scrape everything that your friends have and, and sort it out based on your own preferences, uh, that keeps Facebook from learning what it is you click on and what you don't click on because it all happens locally on your computer, that remediating step also is blocked by the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And this uh, has parallels in other legal regimes. Uh, the, the Clinton era Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998 has this section, mm -hmm. section 1201, that makes it a felony punishable by a $500,000 fine and a five-year prison sentence for a first offense to break digital rights management systems that get in the way of copyrighted works. <laughs> What this means is that security researchers who want to do essential work like discover whether or not 1.25 million Chrysler Jeeps can be driven remotely over the internet, which they did find out, they have to risk felony prosecution to come forward, which they did, right? And then if Chrysler doesn't fix that or GM doesn't fix that, then you risk felony prosecution by issuing a patch that uh, allows you to use this without um, uh, without Chrysler's bl blessing or, or, or GM's blessing. So I don't know how we stop misinformation, right? But I know what's standing in the way, mm -hmm. which is that discovering how it, misinformation works and fixing misinformation, trying different approaches, approaches that have not been sanctioned by the companies that are part of the problem and show no sign of being part of the solution, that those are excluded from our problem, from our solution space. And so, I think that like, if you want to come up with like a minimum viable agreement that we can all agree with, that's where we should start. Something like that. Hello. Yeah. Okay, one, one more question. Uh, one more I question. Think, um, uh, so in the interest of absolute fairness, are there any fellas who'd like to ask a question just because we've had a... Uh, all right. I'm, I'm sorry, but can you catch me afterwards and I'll do my best? Thank you. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. A quick question on your, your process. Uh, you've done a, a lot of fiction and nonfiction, dealing in many cases with very, very serious macroeconomic technology issues. How do you decide what you put into fiction and what you put into yeah. other prose? So what I do is I, the, the kind of fundamental unit of my um, process is the blog post. And the thing is that I sort of trawl through all of the stuff that is trying to get over my transom, you know, feeds and bookmarks and what have you. I take the things that kind of niggle at me as though they were a piece of something larger. And I try to write up the thing that caught my eye for a third party who doesn't know anything about the subject, which causes me to approach it with some rigor. And then that is a kind of mnemonic handle. So I'd like to think of it as like forming this kind of super saturated solution of fragmentary ideas. And then like every now and again, a couple of them will like glom together and nucleate and crystallize into something bigger, more synthetic. And sometimes that's a novel and sometimes it's an essay and sometimes it's a speech and sometimes it's a story and so on. But they don't, um, that's how they, that's how it works. So it's, it's not so much a conscious process as it is like kind of feeding the, feeding the kind of inbox, feeding the in hopper with lots of odd shaped pieces and trusting that a couple of them will stick together. And it's, I think it's somewhat at odds with an older mode of production, which is to pick a subject and research it. I pick a research and find subjects in it. And that's, mm -hmm. I, I find that to be a much more kind of salutary way of approaching it. Do we have time for the one last question about the image? If, if you'd like, uh, I'll see, uh, thank you. Hello. Um, Hi. So I was just looking at this image, and um, I wonder how it relates to a lot of kind of images that we see in philanthropy uh -huh. of the so-called like third world uh -huh. being the subject of um, pollution by the West, right? And and the kinds of images that we have of scarcity um, are. Um, how are they like reflective of a unique kind of like pity that we mm. have in the West? And I mean, at the same time, a kind of like, you know, who should be the savior complex, mm -hmm. you know, that we need to 
reduce our impact in the world to save those people. And um, so how do we, how do we manage um, like our kind of ethical approach to reducing our impact while also not um, kind of like reinscribing that racism yeah. that happens through um, what we label or what the media tells us other countries or places need. So I think that we like are often in a race between atrocity and efficiency where it's like if we'll, we'll have humans do this awful disgusting thing just so long as it takes us to figure out how to get a robot to do it or to improve the process so that the disgusting thing doesn't have to be done anymore. And then our consciences can be alleviated, right? And this is like obviously super problematic if you're one of the humans being asked to do the terrible thing. And you know, e-waste is a really good example of it. This, you know, I, I was constrained by using Creative Commons images that were commercially reproducible. So this, this is in the, the small pool of it. Um, but for me, the, the thing that spoke to me about this image is that it was a kind of uh, parable about how as we sit here and talk about, uh, uh, about it, you know, futuristic designs for material abundance where things gracefully degrade back into the material stream, it's worth remembering that we are building out that technological capacity if it ever arrives by incredibly shitty designs of technologies that are um, made out of materials with duty cycles of 10,000 years and use cycles of 10 seconds that are then offshored to be uh, you know, turned into uh, pluripotent, immortal, toxic waste. Uh, and that, and that, like, um, you know, it, in the same way that, like, a poet might put a skull on their, uh, on their desk to remind them of their mortality, I think anyone proposing a technological utopian program should have some pictures of people dying from the fumes melting off of an acid vat from getting rid of e-waste uh, near, near to hand as they think about it, because, you know, uh, this isn't a paper prototype in a design lab where we pretend that humans are machines. These are actual humans living their lives in, in this way. Uh, and, um, you know, without commenting on savior complexes or implicit racism or whatever, th there's obviously lots of that latent in there. I think that um, we, uh, that, that whatever, however we resolve those problems, to harken back to the answer to the, to the two questions back, however we resolve those problems, we don't resolve them by pretending they're not there. Mm. So you think like images of atrocity help raise kind of consciousness of that? They certainly help me keep things in mind. You know, mm -hmm. remembering, what, who, remembering who's at the other end of things. You know, that I think that a lot of, a lot of the neatness, you know, the, the coal that we dig with our space bar is only, uh, is only, diggable because we don't have to breathe the fumes every time we hit the space bar. And if, you're, if your laptop emitted coal smoke every time you hit the space bar, you would think really differently about it, right? The, the, the negative externalities are a lot easier to ignore when the fleet ditch is downwind of where you poop. Thank you. Thanks. So thank you all for being here. And let's give another round of applause Thanks. to Thank Corey. you, Michael. Thank you, Trisha. There is a reception outside as, uh, for all of you and for Corey, and um, we want to thank Cal IT2 and the gallery Cal IT2 for their support. Please enjoy the reception. And apologize for making fun of their building name. Yeah, <laughs> the Qualcomm Institute. I guess they made a... Oh, really? Oh, really? Qualcomm Institute at Cal IT2.